Welcome. This is Rebecca Clark from Nudge Village, and I'm excited today to have Jane Heron with us. She is a member of Nudge Village, and she's also the Chief Energizing Officer, um, kind of the coach of coaches uh, for training with out the travel.com and so we're glad to have her here today and I'm going to turn it right over to her uh, so that she can move forward with her great presentation and we're anxious to learn from her. Welcome Jane. There are three rules for successfully developing a powerful and professional image. First, consistency creates credibility. Think of your normal work week. Do you work 40 to 50 hours per week? How much free time do you have to set? What you do away from work is your time, but at work you are the company. Marketplace. Men I interviewed felt the number one reason women had been held back was because of the marketplace image, the belief that image was not as important as who they were as a person. Men feel that most people buy with their eyes first, then personal feelings legitimize their actions. I have to agree. If I held up a Pepsi, Coke, 7-Up, or Michelob bottle, could you point them out by shape and colors of the bottles? Advertisers have proven outside packaging draws the consumer to the counter. Consistency is the number one trust builder in advertising. No one, aren't you packaging yourself for success? Drawing attention to yourself to sell your ideas to your superiors, suppliers, subordinates, and peers. Yet when you walk into a department store, go into any men's department, don't you see consistency in the merchandise being offered? And that consistently about 75% business wear and 25% leisure. When you walk into a women's wear department, don't you see inconsistency? Isn't it only 10% 90% leisure wear? Who is more readily being set up? The oil industry has socialized women buy the latest colors and rather than power colors and classic timeless. They know women will spend three times program to be in. This is a problem. 75% of your total business week. How important is marketplace? Walk through the gate. Instantly, you notice things next to Disneyland. The person portraying thrown away his fat, fluffy duck, thrown away his navy blue sailor shirt with those big white buttons. There is no smiling yellow beak, big webbed feet. Beneath the identifiable white sailor hat, the teenager wearing traditional street clothes, pair of faded 501 Levi's. On his face, He's wearing a cheap diamond. Flexing on the first. Welcome to Disneyland. Even though your trip was free, would you feel disappointed? Incongruent with its setting, mental video camera flashes the information. Garbage out. An image does not compute. Out of sync with the expectation is created. Garbage in, garbage out, and your computer stops until it can access additional information to justify what you usually comes in the form of stereotypical roles, labeling, finger pointing, and the creation of a self fulfilling prophecy. First, this would never happen at Disneyland because Disney knows how to create magic in people's lives. Disney knows consistency creates credibility. The power behind the statement, seeing is believing, has built Walt Disney Productions a $730 million business on its consistency. Disney knows lasting impression, only happy guests. People want to be around winners. If you look, act and sound like a winner, you will attract the right developing a powerful and professional Rosemary Owens was promoted into the marketing department. She felt that equal opportunity played the Rosemary always looked nice and 
in clothing to work. However, the guy seldom asked her to join the felt left out. So on a business trip once, it comfortable, on a tailored navy blue jumpsuit. As she was getting on the plane, she ran into her boss, who was also wearing a Topsy twin act created a disaster. First time her boss acted really. Men are just crazy about them. Unknown to them both, she had visually and mentally. Subconsciously, she was communicating by getting on his wavelength. It was poor and opened the line of communication her differently, more like himself. Air trip, and she was Mary Owen. There a man tailor masculine plaids. Making men's dress is Quality suits will be seen as a team player. Women with real clout who have moved up the corporate for alluring power, they know it robs them of powerful women dress for respect, avoiding feminine fabrics and designs and ways of being slinky. The major credibility robbers are. high slit up your skirt, tight, open sexy blouse, or big gaudy jewelry, bangles. If a waiter trips over your large business luncheon, which or the purse is so large it looks like you're a bunch. All details may Rest for respect means Dressing for respect means the rule of successfully developing a powerful and package your power or a self-confidence. One time there was an ancient Hindu all men were gods and treated equally. According to the legend, these misused their magnificence so Mama, the chief to take it away from them and hide it somewhere with Mama called a council brainstormed the big question where to hide this power very man's power Mama said won't do the man will dig down Mama said no again. Her man will be able to dive into the deepest water ocean beds one day. Mama shook his head and said, man will eventually climb every he will find his power and he must find a place to hide. Brahma broke the silence and said, aha. We will hide the power deep. However, think. Walk the ocean bottom. Discover the divine power which is buried deep within each. Packaging your power in business keeps your. We are teaching men to be. Relationships do allow you to. There are times when business. Relationships haven't. This is when your person, graduate student of mine, brilliance earned her designing arch manufacturing because of the greater availability of resources. The team based themselves out of Street in the Garment District in Los.
ever been to the garment district? Very funky and after six months she was asked to take her design and send it to the executive manager being pressed for time. She was forced to take an early morning commuter on the day of the meeting. Unfortunately, the plane was delayed an hour and they arrived at the building five minutes after the meeting began. Dressed so quickly that she forgot who she was presenting herself to, wore a white lace Norma Kamali, a large triangle cut out of the back, of white sandals. When she entered the meeting, the executive seated a long formal table, clutching her portfolio beneath her right arm. Of course, her chair was next to the meeting chair at the far end of the room. She walked past these. Blazing and impressive, Ruth back. She was so overwhelmed by fear that when she vocal cords froze and now began to spin, so faint that she left the meeting without giving her. Walked in looking like. Unfortunately, made such a poor first impression on. She was asked. Colleen, on the other hand, came to the data processing department. Most major companies, they promote those who creatively conform to corporate. One week before Colleen started her job, she spoke to the company park, watched what people wore as they got out of their car. She then walked the halls and went into the cafe. It was easy to pick out the our observation. Nordstrom's, we found two for colors in an they are the jewel tones, royal blue, ruby red, shade green. Colleen was concerned about so we found a large selection of wools, linens, and blouses were solid. confidence starting. Two months after she started the job, her decided to buy my theory and stayed in her suit. It just so happened Top Brass from New York decided to drop in to visit one Friday. Who do you suppose they thought was the super Not only that, but her business image. They invited her to lunch. A month after that lunch, remember what my fortune cookies said? Power and credibility go to those who make a good impression. The good old boy network was looking for the right person. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Jane Heron, and I am here to teach you how to look, act, and sound like a leader. The last 12 minutes you just listened to a image piece that I teach off of my set of tapes and, and recordings. It's called Passport to the Executive Suite, breaking through to the top. I want to give you a little bit of history on where I've been and where I've come from. So when I got out of college, I went to work for Levi Strauss out of San Francisco. I was actually hired as the very first female on the road, and they gave me, geographically, the largest territory in the United States of America. I was given Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, and Montana. And I had five states, and my, my white male counterparts were given Denver proper, Salt Lake proper, Boise proper, so you can notice that there was a lot of difference between the geographical size of those different companies. Within the first month that I was working for Levi Strauss, um, each one of our bags weighed about 50 pounds on carrying all of those blue jeans into the clients. I was in a very, very serious car accident and hit 
a semi broadside off of a freeway, broke my back, broke both ankles, and here I am, the very first woman being hired. Could I call in and say that I was sick? I was literally not only doing this for myself, I was doing this for other women as well because we were breaking through the glass ceiling. And so I found my way to be able to do my work over the telephone, and we used to have modems that the telephone cradle, we would send our orders in through our telephone on a cradle on a modem, old I am, and I did all of my entire work for my very first season flat on my back with a back brace from my shoulder down to my hips and two casts on both of my feet. It was a daunting task, but I became salesman of the year at the end of that very first year. From there, I did go on, and I worked with Wrangler Women's Wear. I worked with General Mills, and that's the ship and shore division. And I was promoted and moved to Los Angeles. And when I lived in Los Angeles, I also taught sales, marketing, and entrepreneurship at the Fashion Institute. So you heard me talk about a couple of my students. And I have been a member of National Speakers Association for over 25 years. And for 22 of those years, I was coached and mentored by the president of National Speakers Association, also the president of sales and marketing executives of Los Angeles. So I had a fabulous mentor and coach. So I believe in coaching. I believe in business coaching, intuitive coaching, life coaching. There's a lot of different ways of getting your coaching. When I came in and came back to Salt Lake City to do my writing and wrote my passport to the exam, got that taped. I then came in and went to work for National Seminars, which is the largest seminar company in the There are three listed here that I worked with over the course of 11 years. Still past seminars, your tracks. Worked with all three of those and the way that I worked with those, and if you happen to be interested in working with any of those, please feel free to write to me because I know some of those companies are looking for speakers. But this was great because I was on stage. I had to produce enough content that would last for a full day. It also would have to match the criteria that they'd laid out in their marketing flyer. So once again, how to look, act, and sound like a leader, they taught me how to look because their marketing material, which were produced by professional copywriters, told me exactly the way that I needed to. So on the top, you see creative leadership. I, I did a lot of different programs for these companies. I did skills for women, creative leadership, uh, management and leadership skills for women, assertiveness training, sales training, negotiation skills, and worked in every single state as 10 different countries for these companies. When I got done working with these individual companies, having that opportunity to do full-day trainings, I then went to work for Dr. Covey. Believe it or not, I was the very first female they put out on the road to teach their training that would go on for large corporations as well as public domain, and then the first things first. So it was a great opportunity to work for Dr. Covey. Also have gotten certified in Sandler Sales. Um, I was a productivity coach for Keller Williams, which is a real estate company, and also worked with professional education. In this is a great company. You can look but they sell coaching, uh, Seven Habits coaching, the Dr. Covey coaching, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad coaching, the Jack Canfield coaching. And as a matter of fact, this is where I met uh, Tiffany Walk peterson and Derek Powers. Both were co-workers with me. When um, I also worked with uh, Wade Cook on selling and teaching people how to invest in the stock market. Now, so a lot of people have come to me and said, how did you get your start in speaking? So this page gives you a little bit of an idea. The tape that you heard on the very beginning was my very first recording that I did in a studio, and that's called Pass. 
So I'm going to move on and we're going to go right into the topic more clearly so that you have an opportunity to understand what specifically. So there's different forms of power and you're going to be understanding these when you are both introducing yourself but also in the way that you are showing up as an entrepreneur. The first form of power is called a derivative power, and that's power that's achieved through the association of a powerful person. You're basically sitting on someone's coattails. So if you notice, I had mentioned that I worked for Dr. Covey, who was the first speaker that he hired for his seven habits of first. Also, I sold for, for Dr. Covey, however, the contract was with Professional Education Institute, but Covey and Rich Dad Poor Dad and Jack Canfield and Carlton Sheets have a contract with Professional Education Institute, but you might hear somebody that works for, um, you know, that may say that they have worked for Dr. Covey, but in fact they may have worked for PEI. Now that's a form of what we call a derivative power of where you're sitting on the coattail of someone who has already achieved in front of you. That's a good thing to do so that you are associating your name and you're deriving your power from them. Secondly would be reverent power and this is when there's power that's granted to a person who looks and sounds most like the person of power. So what you've done is you've studied powerful people. You have said to yourself, if that's what that person is wearing and that's how they sound, then that's what I need to be doing as well. So it's not a copycat, but you are saying this is what people value and that's where the reference is going. Legitimate power is when you have really earned your chops and you have created power through open, honest, and assertive communication. So legitimate power. If I go back here and say to you that I have, in fact, worked with national seminars, uh, skill path seminars, doing their corporate strategies, uh, career tracks, Sandler training, Keller Williams, professional education, done that over a course of 20, 25 years as a member of national speakers, that pretty much says that I've earned my right to be here talking to you today and to be coach of coaches because I've been there and I've done that. In working with those different companies, I worked with Levi Strauss, Wrangler Women's Wear, General Mills. I was in the top 3% of sales with those companies and I was the first woman. That's cool as I look back to that. I don't know how I did it, but some you know, there were specific strategies that I did do. And with these three companies, I had to sell from the platform nationally from skill path, from career track, selling from the platform. So if you wanted to learn how to sell from the platform, you're a person who needs to do that, be sure to write to me at Training Without the Travel. As an expert, an expert power is somebody who has informational power and they are perceived as the expert in the industry. So that could be a psychological uh, expertise, it could be a technical expertise, and what I have found is that in working with those people that many times they may have a PhD, but they do not know how to look, act, or sound like the speaker or like the leader, and they too have needed to work with a coach that coaches others. So we talked just a little bit in that first 12 minutes about what was influencing the perception of power in the few stories that I did give you. The, one of the stories that I gave you was about a woman by the name of Robin who, sex role stereotyping, where she had flown to San Francisco, her, her airplane was late, and she showed up in a Norma Kamali uh, linen, or excuse me, a, 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 a lace dress, and it had a cutout of the back. And so the sex role stereotype that she was stepping into was uh, a fashion maiden, she was being the woman who was very uh, sexy. And when you're walking into a large group of men, you have to remember that men perceive power. Men perceive the power they're willing to give to you through what they see. 
So when you're going to a fashion image consultant or an image consultant and they are there to teach you how to maybe look the best that you can in your clothing, but they're not looking at what you're trying to project, then they might that might be the wrong image consultant for you to go to. For this gal, she walked into the meeting, she had on a very cute dress. Somebody would say it was very fashionable, but it did not have rapport with the people that she was speaking to. I always say you should dress 10% better than the people that you are speaking to, and you should match the expectation of who you are selling to. This weekend I was at an entrepreneurial uh, program, full-day program from 9 in the morning till 7 o'clock at night of entrepreneurial women who were selling their coaching packages. One of the women in the entire group had hired me previous to this particular event. We worked with her. Now, she was a person who liked wearing a lot of things that would make her look cute and sexy and sparkly and all the other things. And I challenged her to do a few of the things that I was going to teach, which I'm so the first thing is is that you want to project about 10% more personal power. You want to be dressed 10% better than anybody in your audience. And you want to meet the expectations of who you're selling to and what they expect you If somebody is looking at me as the coach of coaches, then wouldn't you expect me to, one, protect my personal to project power, and three, know how to teach you about the power centers of your body and how you project, are uh, projecting and protecting both of those. There are company politics when you are going into a corporation. I, as a speaker, as a trainer, as a facilitator, don't understand some of the company politics that the company that I'm being hired into, then I have not done my homework. There's also some unwritten rules, and sometimes those unwritten rules, sometimes even within a small community of entrepreneurs, there may be someone who's perceived as the top dog, and everybody's going to look at the way that top dog dresses, and we all begin to emulate. Not necessarily the right thing to do, because it could be that that person has earned her position, and now she is able to break some of the rules. Once you have earned your position, that's when you have the ability to break some of the rules. If you're the wannabe, if you're the person who's moving up that ladder, then you want to follow these rules that I'm giving you right now. Unwritten rules. There's, let me give you an example of one of the unwritten rules that you will see in politics right now. If you watch the um, any of the political uh, uh, campaigns or any of the different types of talks that are going on, You'll notice that the president or the person who is the highest person of power, I'm talking about me, will always be wearing a red necktie, and it's not a scarlet red. It is a clariot red. And the person who is one position down is always wearing a blue, somewhere around a royal blue. Watch this in the future. It's an unspoken rule. The person who is wearing the clariot red is the man so there's just an example of an unwritten rule. But there's unwritten rules whether we're walking into a small group of people, whether I'm walking into a um, Facebook group. There's, a, there's written and unwritten rules. And the whole idea is, is to follow those rules. When you're following those rules, people respect you when you're wanting to look, act, and sound presenting yourself, you want to make sure that first impressions are lasting impressions. As you heard on the first 12 minutes of this, I brought this up several different times. You want to make sure that your appearance, your clothing, your hair, your nails, your jewelry, your voice, body language are all in sync. In sync to the expectation of what your viewing audience has for you in the position that you're selling yourself into. Now, keep in mind, 
there is this thing that's called the hatchet job. And I remember David Letterman being interviewed many years ago. started on TV as a regular host, and he, you know, he's just a small-town guy from Indiana. He's now going to New York City and trying to... He said in this interview, he said, you know, he said, I learned really quick that there are people out there that have a hatchet. They're willing to do a hatchet job on you. They want to find something about you that doesn't quite fit. They want to find something about you that they can tear down. I found out that very early on that if I'm willing to project 10% more than I really am, that when they do the hatchet job, I'm just back to being Dave, just back to being normal. So the same thing applies for you. You want to be 10% better than anybody that's in your audience or in your room dress that way. You want to dress 10% better than the expectation. I say just 10% because if you dress 90% better than the people, then people cannot relate to you. You're, you've just gone way too far, and they will do, they will turn off, and they won't even do the hatchet job. They will have turned off because they cannot relate. So there is this relatability as well as care of the hatchet job. Now there is this thing between power and femininity where a lot of women will say, well, I'm not going to wear a suit because I need to look very feminine. I like to have all, I just like to really look like a woman. Yet what they've done is they have sold themselves out. There are seven erogenous zones. You may look those up. And there is this thing that's called dressing up and dressing down. When we've looked at dressing up, we're not looking at fashion. What we are looking at is protect seven erogenous zones, zipping them up. If you know Reiki or any kind of, if you're a healer, you know what I mean by zipping up the energy. Dressing up means that you have brought the clothing all the way up. Now, as a woman, let's go back to a man for just a second. You'll notice a man, he has on a suit jacket. The jacket is the mantle piece. I mentioned 12 minutes. The mantle piece is the, even if it's a shirt that is over a tank top, that's a mantle piece. But a suit jacket is a mantle piece go back through the history of fashion, you will notice that people who were powerful, people who were carrying the weight of the world, people who, like Atlas, had to harness the weight of the world, had to wear a mantle on their shoulders to be able to harness that weight of the world. What they also did is they protected the power centers. And your power center, most important power center, is the heart and the throat. If you are watching me right now, you would be able to see my face, my throat, as well as my heart area. Every great leader throughout history has protected their throat and their heart chakras, or their throat and their heart area. Why do men wear neckties? They do not know. They have no clue of why they wear a necktie. It's because it's been a system handed down that has taught them a jacket, protects the shoulders, gives you a stronger image. When the suit jacket is closed, it's protecting heart chakra as well as the solar plex. And the necktie is covering the throat chakra and when that necktie is pushed up. Native Americans, when they were out in the, in, in the wild, you'll notice that they used to wear a squash blossom or a flat piece of turquoise that was directly over the Adam's apple. That Adam's apple was, it was put there because if somebody had a bow and arrow, and if that arrow came at the Adam's apple, one, it would deem, it would probably kill them, but number two, it would not allow them to speak ruined the, the vocal area. All great leaders must be able to speak. So if you go back through history, 
look at fashion through history, whether that was the knight in shining armor or it is today's man in a suit. He is protecting the throat, the heart, and the solar plex through the clothing. As I said in the very first 12 minutes, that you notice that if you walk into a menswear department, they are consistent in teaching men how to dress, to be powerful, and to protect their power centers. If we walked into a woman's department, it's, it's very inconsistent, and inconsistency in anything creates a lack of credibility. It creates confusion. Confusion kills a sale every single time. So dressing up means for a woman that I'm going to wear a mantle piece, at least a shirt over a tank top. The more skin you show, the more people want to touch you. People walk over to you and touch you because you're showing skin if it's just a sleeveless dress. The person who is being touched is the lowest person on the totem pole. They are being the person who is being asked to do things for other people. So if you go back into the history of fashion, and if you do not want to be doing things for other people, put on your mantelpiece, then protect your power, which is your, your heart chakra and the throat. For a woman, that may mean that I'm just going to use a jewel neck uh, silk blouse up underneath. I, I can, if I really need protection, and if I'm walking in working with, I will wear something that's a higher, goes all the way up underneath my skin. Do I use a beautiful silk? Of course I do. Do I have a, a beautiful scarf? Of course I do. So I can be just like my male counterpart by wearing a beautiful scarf. Because that's equal to a man's neck. A dressing down would mean I am going to be using, I'll be using, uh, I will show more skin. I might have a V-neck and I'm down. I might push the sleeves up on my suit. That's dressing down. And so I want to pay attention to whether I am dressing up or I'm dressing down. If I am in a position that I want people to come over and gravitate toward me, that's when I may take off my suit jacket and be a, have a total appearance of approachability. But I, well, as soon as I need that power, I'm going to put that jacket. So let's keep moving because people are going to reward those who look, sound, and act like the mental expectation that's in their mindset. I'm sure you've seen these numbers before. This came from Albert. It was uh, out of UCLA. And there are these three numbers, and these three numbers basically say that out of these three numbers, 50 One of these holds the most power, and that one that holds the most power is the 55 So write this down. 55% of how we perceive another person, we do it through our eyes. And what we see, so that nonverbal is, as I'm looking at you, let's say that you're on television, I turn the volume down, I'm looking at you, it's going to be your body movements, it's going to be just what I see as far as your clothing, it's going to be how you are holding your posture, it is going to be, uh, all of those things are the nonverbal level, it's what I see, that is the 55 so let's say that it's a recording, like right now, you see things on the screen, but if this screen was black and you were only listening to my voice, that's 38%. So sometimes we wonder, well, I, I sent somebody an email and I told them exactly what I was thinking, but what you have to remember, emails and texts are probably the worst way that you can communicate because they may be hearing your voice in a snotty way, in a hateful way, in their head, and whatever you've said really doesn't mean anything because they're hearing your voice that one time that you came unglued. So 38% of the entire message is through the sound of your voice. And 7% goes to the words. 
The words I've chosen today are probably less important than of my voice was and what you're seeing on the screen today. People reward those who look and sound most like themselves first and then others. Now, if you are a person who are, is not succeeding as an entrepreneur and you walk into a meeting and you notice that you hang out with other people who look and sound a lot like you, there's a real good chance that they have not dressed to be our person in the room. They have not dressed to meet the expectations of how people see a powerful person or hear a powerful person or how a person, powerful person acts like a leader. So be aware of how you are looking, sounding, and acting and meeting the mental expectations. There's going to be some specific rules that I'd like you to take, and those rules are coming about in that I want you to have instant credibility. So here's what you're going to do for color. If I'm working with men, I want to use more menswear colors. So I may use a black, a gray, a neat. If I am going and working with women on color, then I'm going to look at using royal colors, colors that would, you would find in a crown. That would be royal blue. That could be my jade green. That could be a burgundy or a ruby red. Now, red is very interesting. I can wear a uh, burgundy when I'm working. I don't wear a scarlet red. Scarlet letter has a sexual tone. When I'm using the color of working with both men or women, team that with a white blouse underneath for the highest level of credibility, put a cream, to black and all the other different colors. But white with the solid color on your mantelpiece will be the highest level of credibility. Bring that over to a nun. A nun, when she used to be, when we see more she wore black on the outside and then the white framed the face. Black is the number one color to protect your power. That's why nuns wore it. It protects every single power center and typically nuns had, you know, way back when, the, the habit would go all the way from the top of their head all the way down to their toes, and then gradually it moved to be knee never shorter than that. So color. Fabrication. You want to make sure that when I'm working with men, I'm going to go toward my more male-like fabrications. I still can do a linen. I still could do a silk. But I may be using a wool tweed or I might be using some sort of a ma more masculine fabrication when I'm working with men. Now, when I'm working with women, because women love fabric, they love to touch, we love to be able to see, then I may go into my um, fabrications that are going to be silks and linen, my poly cotton, something that's got something more interest. On my style, we've kind of talked about that already, and that, um, but I will add this, is that the highest level of credibility is going to be your two-piece as a female. Closed-toed shoes and closed heel is going to be the highest level of credibility for your style. Level will be a blazer, and you can wear that with a skirt. That's going to be the next highest level. Blazer with pant will be the third level. And when it comes to shoes, closed-toed, closed-heel, highest level of credibility. Next level would be closed-toed, open-heel. Third level would be closed-heel, open-toe. And the last on the list would be sandals. That would be your lowest level of credibility. When I'm looking at giving a speech or if I'm in working a, any kind of a – if I'm working any kind of an – where people are walking toward me. I want to use my stance, and my stance needs to be at attention. Men have learned how to stand at attention from a very t early age when they started learning how to play the military game. So they started learning long ago of the power of that stance. And what that stance is, is my heels are together, my toes are apart just a little bit, my shoulders are back, and if you really are afraid of public, try this. Put behind your back, 
put your hands together behind your back. There you get to pump your little sweat balls behind your back. And what that's doing is it's forcing your shoulders out and it's causing people to be able to see the frame of that mantle and that you are very, very strong. And so the, um, the, then we want to have the, the voice of authority. And the voice of authority is going to be that you want to make sure that you are learning how to project your voice. Uh, I recently worked with this client, and the client um, had a very high voice. And the very high voice is um, it, it's, it's a really low level of credibility. It almost had a little girl's voice, and it just was not working because she was a person who wanted to have a high level of credibility. So the exercise that I gave to her was, laughing about this a little bit, I had to learn how to move the sound from the center of her head down to her solar plex, and that's a long register of sound to move from the top of your head all the way down to your belly. So with that, what she needed to be able to do is, what I had her do is to sit quietly and to sit on the toilet and to bend over and to read aloud. And as she was bending over and reading aloud, she could will begin to feel the register of your voice moving down, down, down. And she also Skypes with her grandchildren often. So I had her practice with her voice so she could use the higher range and the lower range because she was very stuck in one sound. The sound that she was using was a very low credibility sound. And so you want to have a voice of authority. If I'm a speaker, I want to be able to project my voice up and over the entire first few rows of my audience. So let's back it up. So your colors, I'm going to be knowing, am I working with men or am I working with women? Fabric, I'm going to notice if I'm working with men or with women. Style, highest level of credibility is a two-piece suit. Then it's going to be the blazer with a skirt, blazer with pants. And at minimum, if I walk in and don't have any of those things, I want to make sure that I have some sort of like a, a, a menswear cotton shirt or even a long cotton shirt or some sort of a shirt over whatever under blouse that I might have. That's giving me the mantle piece. That would be the least that I want to do. And then I want to make sure that my stance is very at attention. So when I want to have high credibility, right now when I'm sitting here, I am sitting up like a newscaster as I am delivering this speech. If you are doing teleseminars, do not slouch in your seat. Sit up as if there is a book on top of your head so you can project the sound at all the way across your room. And now you have the voice of authority. Let's go to the next slide, and we are now wanting to look at what's instantly approachable. Now, this is where I want the men in the audience to listen in, because approachability is something we women have down. We've had to learn how to get you guys to come to us forever, and we had to learn how to be the one that was going to get to have everybody's attention. So what are we going to do when it comes to color, fabric, style, stance, and voice, which is a little bit different than when we want high credibility? If I already have the power and I've been wearing my mantelpiece, I'm at a meet. I now want to be perceived softer. I want to be the person who is much more approachable. Or I'm the guy who's always been the guy who's barking out orders, and uh, everybody's a little scared of me, and I now need to be more approachable. So the main thing that I'll do with that is I'm going to come to style first, and that would be is I would remove my jacket. I might roll up my sleeve. If I have a necktie, I would take that off and unbutton one button, maybe two, but not three because then you move into Disco Danny, and that's like uh, a little more approachable than we want you to be. 
Okay. So on, uh, on this approachability, we then, on the stance, I'm going to move, let's go back, because the military stance, we learned how to stand. And now, the next command that you would get is, at ease, soldier. As a speaker, what I want to do is to emulate that. And that is going to be where my feet, instead of coming clear out to uh, shoulder width, I want them, my feet to be directly underneath my hip orbs. So for women, women have different width of hips. So you figure that out for yourself. Does that mean your, your feet are inches apart, six inches apart, eight inches apart? I'm not sure where that's going, but it's going to be directly in alignment to your hip orb. Then do want to bring your hand behind your back again. You're going to go ahead and stay in that position because when you're nervous, that is a very powerful position to be in because you appear at ease and your audience at ease. And when you really feel at ease, then you can bring your hands out and begin to gest gesturing with your hands can be almost hypnotic. Great when you learn how to use your hands in a way to hypnotize your audience. But until you learn how to do that, make sure that your hands are staying behind your back. If I am using my hands, I want to use my hands on purpose. And so let's say that I break a speech down and I am talking to someone, um, and I will uh, break it down into chunks because. And if I'm talking to men, men like things organized into small compartments. You notice how they can compartmentalize their life, and women, we tend to not compartmentalize our life. But if I'm talking to a group of men, and typically that means that I may be the, you know, the only woman there, I have to talk more like the way they think so that I'm getting their attention. So I might then use my hands and say I have three things I want to talk to you about. I'm holding up. Then I'm holding up the first finger, or I'm touching the very first finger. Number one, and then I'm third finger, number three. Then break your speech into pieces where you have, even if you have to break your speech you know, into five different little departments, but each one has three things that you want to mention, great, because it's an easy way for people to be able Notice on my slides, other than the very first slide, which was total chaos, but all my other slides are broken into threes. And so on instant approachability, I'm going to take my jacket off, push my sleeve up. Typically as a woman, I may have just an under blouse that's a short sleeve blouse, which will then people are going to see my pretty bracelets or my pretty watch, my jewelry. They'll notice those type of things. And you'll notice they even want to come up and touch or see or have you point them out. If they're doing that, if they want to see those things, that means of them, that you have not only brought them to you, but you now have the ability to be able to communicate well with them. Now, I want to go back just for a second. If I want high credibility on stance, I want to make sure that I am square to the person that's listening to me. So I'm going to square up. If I want to be approachable on stance, I'm going to stand or sit at a diagonal. That diagonal is going to make me more approachable. Now, you'll notice that when you watch a newscaster, they're square to the camera. If I am watching someone who is interviewing another individual, they're always at a diagonal to that person. I've got more to talk about that diagonal, but I won't be able to have time to do it. Okay. So on approachability, I'm going to make sure that my body is at ease. My head is going to be square, but when I'm wanting to get myself even more approachable, this is when I'm going to tip smile, and you're going to hear even the difference in my voice right now, as it makes my voice sound more approachable. If I want to have the voice of authority, I'm going to be standing or sitting as if there is a plate on my head, and I'm very square to the camera. So that is going to be the difference between credibility and approachability. 
I'm being more of an interviewer or asking. I have a more of a melodic tone in my voice. Um, my clothing is going to be more casual, and this is when I can wear my fuzzy sweat angora sweater. I can wear some of the fabrications that are more touchable. I can wear things that are going to be more um, multicolor, that are are um, paper florals or um, even a little psychedelic cha-cha, as I would call that in my drawing. So uh, this is my client, Laura King. And she is a person who likes psychedelic cha-cha. She really loves to wear a lot of sparkle and a lot of different things. But we were at this on Saturday, and I had coached her on her speech. So in this picture, as you can see, she's really projecting power. She's got a man-tailored suit, for heaven's sakes. It's even got the pinstripe in it, and she, she looks highly credible, very powerful. She's really projecting a high level of authority. And I will tell you, out of everyone at this meeting, and there were over 200 women at you guys, she was the most well-dressed. She looked and sounded like a leader, and she was, hands down, the best presenter there. She's going to get invited to speak again. A lot of people ask me, how do you get speech? First of all, you have to look, act, and sound like a leader, and people will begin to invite you to come at their lunch and speech. We worked very hard on getting a very good and she had her sales program that she went directly into. And by doing that, she's basically going to be putting money in her pocket today and tomorrow because she's going to get invited back to be very approachable, feminine, and memorable, but she was also powerful, credible, and had a high level of authority. Her story was wonderful because it had lots of good personal stories, humor, hard facts, and she sold from the platform, which is what we're doing. I'm selling from the platform right now, and I'm wondering, do you need coached? I work with speakers. I work with consultants. I help them to learn how to sell from the platform from teleseminars. And you can go directly to my website, which is called Training Without the Travel, and you can schedule a time with me. I also have a really cool, if you go into the store, I'm getting ready to start a whole new project that's uh, called Training Without the Travel. And if you go directly to my website, which is trainingwithoutthetravel.com, and if you go over to the store, I have a mastermind membership. And basically, you're going to get five podcasts per week. That's a 15-minute podcast. If you like this speech, you kind of have my style now. You also are going to get a master of 365 days. And I normally charge $29.95 per month for this, but the first 100 people that go as a result of listening to this training, I charge $100 for all of 2014. So if you or your team are willing and you're ready to be coached. I'm ready to coach for you. The least expensive way to work with me is to join my mastermind. $100 for a whole year of 2014. And you just go over to my store area and you'll see this image. will have a link that will take you directly to the, the, to the store and allow you to check in for right now. I want to say thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to work with you to help you look, act, and sound like a leader. look forward to talking to you again soon. Now back to Rebecca.